Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm Joe Johnson. And as usual, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello. And Andrew Walker. Hello, hello, hello. We gotta come up with a fun creative nickname. I know. Match Imaginos I know. Pete here. We'll we'll work on it. Joe Johnson's kinda of boring. <laughs> I do sometimes go by Joe Hollywood. Maybe I'll introduce oh, myself. Oh, there as we Joe go. Hollywood. There we go. Um who would ever have thought that, Joe? <laughs> I know. Who? <laughs> Who? So unlike me. <laughs> um, so back in 1971, Don McLean released American Pie that uh, contains the phrase, the day the music died. And in that case, he was referring to the 1959 plane crash that killed Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens, and almost took Waylon Jennings, if not for a coin flip, did you guys ever hear that story? Nope. Uh, Waylon Jennings flipped a coin for a seat on the plane and lost. Uh, I forget who took it in his place. It might have been Big Bopper, but uh, he narrowly escaped death on a coin toss. Oh, wow. Um, but that phrase, the day the music died, can apply to a wide variety, a, a huge number of musicians who were taken from us uh, when they were young or uh, before their time. And as I was researching this topic, I discovered a phrase called the 27 Club. Now, Andrew, you said you were, you're familiar with the 27 Club. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, Mr. Morrison, uh, I think Mr. Janis Cobain. Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, yeah. Amy Winehouse, all died at 27. Oh, wow. Which is, it gives you goosebumps. It's really eerie. And uh, apparently Amy Winehouse had a fear Knowing that these legends before her died at 27, she had a fear, almost a phobia, that she was going to die at 27. And so or was it a self self-fulfilling prophecy? prophecy? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, some of the details. Jim Morrison died uh, at 27 in 1971 uh, in Paris, France. Uh, now, his official cause of death was heart failure, but they did not perform an autopsy. And his uh, friends and family speculate that he had accidentally taken heroin thinking it was cocaine and OD'd. Uh, and that, that's depicted in, in uh, well, his death is depicted in the, the Doors movie with Oliver Val Stone. Kilmer, yeah. who what? should have won an Oscar for that performance. Have you guys seen The Doors? I have not. No, not no. yet. I heard it was great. It's yeah. a little long. Um, but I usually like I remember the movie Oliver poster. Stone movies. What's that? I remember the movie poster with Val Kilmer on it. Yeah. Yep. And... and I think it was the band said that when Val Kilmer was singing as Jim Morrison, they couldn't tell when when it was Val singing or when it was a track of Jim Morrison. He oh, wow. he was that spot on. And so if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's, it's just an amazing transcendent performance that he was not adequately recognized for. Uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, died in London at 27 after taking 18 times the recommended dosage of sleeping pills Ugh. in September of 1970. Uh, 1970 was a bad year because Janis Joplin also died in 1970 at 27, so both her and Hendrix. Uh, she died of a heroin overdose in her Hollywood hotel room. In 1994, Kurt Cobain died at 27 in Seattle. Now, we all know that he had committed suicide, but um, his toxicology report said that there was heroin and valium in his system uh, amy winehouse we mentioned died at 27 in 2011 she dabbled in the hard stuff heroin and crack but actually died due to alcohol poisoning and that was morrison's vice too was alcohol yeah right. that that was the big one and contributed mm -hmm. to his poor health uh so yeah so all of those performers died at 27 that's uh that's an eerie coincidence if if you're a big name, yeah, I would be nervous about my 27th <laughs> birthday, man. Uh, I would just skip it. 26, <laughs> like, how old are you now? 28. Aren't you? Nope. It's 28? like the 13th floor at a hotel. <clears throat> yeah. Just just not name it. Joe, did you come across any uh, statistical comparisons to other ages of like famous people? Like, how many famous people were 32? <laughs> you know, musicians, movie stars. Who met a tragic death, whether killed or yeah, I didn't did see anything like that. But the the twenty one club 
was pretty much created uh, with Kurt Cobain's Cobain's death. Um, People had known that Morrison, Hendrix, and Joplin had died at 27, but no one made a big deal out of it until Kurt Cobain died at 27, and and Uh then the— so people started talking about this curse or whatever and you, you add want to Amy call Winehouse it. to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So there's yeah, no intriguing. Yeah, it'd be like someone saying, "Oh, well, you, you ever heard of the '99 curse?" Like, <laughs> if people want to get the '99. I'm like, I think that's called old age. Man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't worry about. It. It's Huey, isn't it? Like, not really. <laughs> I hope. I hope I die in the '99 <laughs> club. We'll see. Hey, well, we've made it past 27, so. <laughs> right there you go. So all of them had their vices. Other celebrities who, who tragically died of uh, ODs or, or contributed to their death, of course, you got Judy Garland, the age of 47. What a tragic story. She died in 1969. There's stories of her as, uh, as Dorothy in Wizard of Oz. The studios just hit her, making her take uppers and downers to and, and trying to keep her weight down, and she was called a fat pig, and... And uh, it just messed with her mental health, and she was dependent on that stuff her entire life, and it just took a toll on her. Um, now, Michael Jackson, and I will also say Prince and Elvis, uh, they all died of, I guess you would call it an OD, but it was more of a pres- prescribed OD. Like, their doctors were complicit. Yeah. Um, and in the case of Elvis, I remember hearing the story that he was lying in bed with his girlfriend, Ginger, at the time. And he was an insomniac, and a lot, of, a lot of it had to do with his drug use. And he could not fall asleep. And he was trying to read a book. And he would call one of his uh, Memphis Mafia to come up and deliver a packet of, of sleeping powder, they called it. He would mix it in whenever he was drinking. It didn't work. He called for another one. He took it. It didn't work called for another one and they kept delivering it to him and then he gets up to use the bathroom and uh, the rest is history the king died on the throne and uh-huh. um and so that was you know that was a lot of a lot of people complicit in that death uh the doctor was was uh, indicted you know i think he i think he dodged any serious charges but he was like, well, if I don't give it to him, he'll get it somewhere else and he'll get it illegally. That is, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. That, um, I have a personal, but you know, I, yeah. I have a medical background and that's complicit. When you, if you don't know, I have a, an old mentor of mine taught me, never have a lawyer teach you physiology or pharmacology on the stand. <laughs> you never want a lawyer teaching a doctor. Any of them that's the right. I feel uh, the same thing's responsible for Michael Jackson's death. He had, yes. uh, yeah. The doctor uh, prescribing, over prescribing. Yes, man. Yeah. Get surrounded yeah. by yes, man. Celebrity no. who can say it, no to a get, celebrity. Yeah, you get to a point where you can't, you can't tell them no because they're not going to listen to anybody else. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, as a doctor, you'd rather they get it from somewhere else because that's your reputation. Then you yeah. lose your license because yeah. you yeah. just they don't get it from me. Like, you can. I mean, you're not Moody's, uh, close, you know, <laughs> co-signing <laughs> credit default swaps or something. Yeah, but they're celebrities. You're invited into their home, or you know, it's it, that allure of being in close contact with a celebrity is is intoxicating. Um, and then I'm also going to add Whitney Houston to that list. She, oh, she died geez. at 48 in 2012 uh, in her bathtub. Just uh, took a overdose of uh, some sleeping meds or whatever, and then fell asleep in the tub and drowned. So uh, again, it's just people. Um, just kowtowing to these celebrities and what do you want? What do you need? And, and, uh, it's a tragic end. Do we remember when Whitney Houston died? What? what yeah, name? it was 2012. Okay. Uh, so okay. the age of 48. So th- there was a decade where we lost Prince, Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston all yeah. in one decade. I mean, geez. And, and Bowie. Boy. And yeah. George Michael died George around that time. A lot of eighties. Chris Cornell. Man. I love yeah. that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Heartbreaking. If you grew up in the eighties, losing those, those stars. Yeah. Prince hit me hard. I remember learning, it came up on my Facebook feed or something, and I was like, what, what Prince? Which Prince? Are you talking about the Prince? Uh, that hit me pretty hard. When, what was when, the official cause? That they, he OD'd they... on fent- fentanyl? fentanyl? Oh. It, was some, it was some sort of painkiller, yeah. Yeah. I just remember that. I don't remember which one. Yeah, and they found him in an, his elevator at, uh, oh, at uh, Paisley Park. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just... Uh, tragic endings on, on these icons these legends it kind of goes back to the episode we did a while back where they say the the brightest star uh you know peters out the quickest and that applies to these singers larger than life singers just met tragic uh ends too early 
Um, you know, Elvis, the death of Elvis is one of those things where people from my generation remember where they were when they heard the news, and it was just devastating. Yeah. Um, tragic. Um, so, yeah, so th- those are uh, some of the, uh, the day the music died for a lot of people were when a lot of these legends passed away uh, at the, basically at their own hand or just being uh, aided and abetted by their their doctors, which is really, really sad. Um, but there's no shortage of, of stories of musicians and legends that um, met tragic ends. No. Um, in, and in some cases um, it resulted in murder, and uh, it's really, really tragic. Now, one of those I'm going to talk about um, is, and I'm going to go back to a memory that I have, There was a special on television, uh, the Motown anniversary, 25th anniversary television special. Uh, And and that aired in 83. How old were you guys in 83? Do you guys remember seeing this? uh, I was negative one. (laughs) Negative one. I was four. Okay. So you guys missed out. So Motown celebrated their 25th anniversary, and it was legendary. It was the first time people saw Michael Jackson do the moonwalk on uh, television and the crowd audibly gasped when he did it like what was that and i remember seeing that um and that special in- impacted me so much that when i was in pasadena for a conference i found out that i wasn't too far from the pasadena civic auditorium so i walked over to the civic auditorium and they were getting set up for some sort of performance or a concert so i sat in the auditorium just picked a chair saw the stage lights and everything, and just imagined Michael Jackson moonwalking across that stage. He was reunited with the Jackson 5. He performed with the Jackson 5. Then, uh, on condition of his contract, he performed Billie Jean, I think in another song, uh, as solo act. But there were legends of Motown that were all at this Pasadena Civic Auditorium to celebrate the anniversary, and one of them was Marvin Gaye. And Marvin Gaye did this moving speech about the history of black music, the impact of Motown. And then he sang his classic anthem, What's Going On. And everybody was talking about that performance, that whole special. Uh, It was a big deal. It was a really big deal. Imagine the shock. A year later, Marvin Gaye is no longer with us. Yeah. And I don't know how many people from your generation realize that he met a avoidable, shocking, tragic ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically what happened on April 1st, 1984, Marvin Gaye was at his family home with his parents, and he broke up a fight between his mother and father. They were arguing about something. He got in the middle of it. Uh, I guess it got physical with his dad, Marvin Gaye Sr., and for some reason, Marvin Gaye Sr. pulled out a gun and shot Marvin Gaye twice. Once in the heart, right in the chest, and once in the shoulder. Uh, one day shy of his 45th birthday. And I, you got to wonder, I mean, what would prompt a father to draw a weapon on his son and kill his son? It was so shocking when that news broke uh, that Marvin Gaye was no longer with us at 45. Uh, the father was charged. Um, he was. Uh, it was a reduced voluntary manslaughter charge, given a suspended six-year sentence in probation, which makes it sound like I don't think he did any jail time. And uh, he ended up dying in a nursing home in 1998. So that was, gosh, how many years after uh, after he murdered his 14 son? Years. Yeah. yeah, isn't that Almost, wild? That's, that's did he ever wild. give an interview? Did they ever ask him like what? I've yeah, never motivation. Seen, I'll have to look and see if there's any videos out there like what I, uh, would prompt a father to do yeah. that. I knew I knew it was his own dad, but I'd never heard of any motivation. If it was some sort of jealousy or severe mental break or substance abuse or, you know yeah. a substance issue yeah, I, don't I i don't know well when when you're looking at a manslaughter charge that it's, i mean obviously they're saying it wasn't premeditated right. which i can understand but sure. it sure sounds like the the penalty was was pretty slight considering <clears throat> that you know society america was robbed of of this amazing performer and did marvin um, gay's mother ever comment on like what what was that argument about that she felt that her son had to get involved to yeah, separate I them i haven't and... heard any of that so so it's just a shocking uh end to uh, a bright bright talent have you guys ever been to the motown museum in detroit 
Ooh, it is yeah. amazing. I was I was kind of embarrassed that I pretty much grew up here in the Detroit area and I had not visited the Motown Museum until fairly recently and I was blown away. Blown away when when I went to the museum and they give you that intimate tour and you go into the the uh, control room of the studio there and you see that the wood on the floor is worn and they explain that during the recording process, when the performers were in the studio with the mics and the piano and all that, the people in the control room were dancing and stomping their feet, and they wore out the wood of the floor of the control room. Uh, so if you haven't been to the Motown Museum, make sure you get out there. It's it's legendary. It's yeah, history. It's it. mm -hmm. And you get to see the studio, and, and, um, and, and, it's, and there's a museum aspect, too. I guess Michael Jackson donated a glove and some other stuff that's on display at the Motown Museum. So, uh, you know, Motown had a huge impact on music in, in the world, and um, Marvin Gaye was, was one of their shining stars, and he was just taken from us uh, way too soon. Yeah, uh, I, I went to the museum, uh, I believe it was sixth grade, for a full uh, a class. Uh, field trip? Field trip, yeah. yeah, yeah. I always, almost had a full uh, uh, slash trip or whatever, but uh, <laughs> tongue-tied. Uh, and it was it was great. Um, I heard that it's currently undergoing a renovation, and and they're adding like a big new building that Ford is kind of putting money up for. Yeah. So whenever I hear that it's completely done, then I'll go because I think it just might be partially done. Yeah. So whenever that's done, I I want to go. What they said during the the tour is that uh, Barry Gordy would purchase other homes around the home the main home that had the studio. And in those other homes, they like the female performers would go through etiquette classes and how to present themselves during interviews and performances and how to walk and how to talk. And so they occupied several of those homes on that particular street. Um, and so I guess they're trying to turn that whole thing into a complex. Uh, I would love to see like a revival in Detroit of, of R&B and soul music to that yeah. level. That would be, yeah, yeah man, that would be great. Amazing history, and not not just uh, be known from Madonna, Kid Rock, Eminem, Bob Seger, but you know, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, Imaginos Pete, uh, you have a uh, shining star of a performer who was taken to us uh, too soon. Uh, why don't you give yeah. us a little bit of details about your topic today? Yeah, mine. Uh, which again, I to be full disclosure, uh, Joe. Helped me pick this one out because I was saying I was looking at a couple of these like hey, you might want to look into Sam Cooke, who, unfortunately, when you talk about Marvin Gaye, what in 1984 Sam Cooke was taken 20 years earlier in 1964, and Sam Cooke is basically the godfather of of soul. He started off as a gospel singer, or you know, it'd be the king of soul. You know, I'd go with king of soul. And so it's basically I, I, one of the documentaries, and there was I forgot the actual name of it because I was just catching it on the side and it was narrated by Danny Glover. It was wonderful and interviewed all of his uh, friends and family. They said that gospel plus rock and roll equals soul. Hmm. Cause back then when you start off as a gospel singer, gospel is the, it's God's music. Rock and yeah. roll is the devil's music. <laughs> right. But it's, but it's often that stepping stone. Right. Right. So, that slippery, <laughs> slippery slope of slin. Right. Sin. <laughs> yeah, sin, exactly. And, and Sam, and, and Sam Cook, what I didn't realize, and which is, you know, my own personal disgrace, I loved some of his songs. I didn't know who was singing at the time because just it's in the background. You just yep. hear that old soulful voice, and they said his voice was like butter. It absolutely is. Yeah, you know, he he doesn't have the name recognition to match the 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 songs that you subconsciously know. In my right. opinion, you yeah. you could watch at least of, exactly people uh, uh, like three generations younger than you, Joe. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was gonna say, don't lump me in with you guys. No, 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 I was I, familiar with Sam. Yeah. Cook at an early yeah, age. Yeah, just to, I want to yeah. alert everyone out there. Yeah, Any, <laughs> whatever kind of uh, not, ignorance that is uh, displayed in this podcast, <laughs> Joe's not a part of. But most of it resides within me. I drag Andrew in every once in a while. But no, Sam Cook, you know, what, what was tragic about him cut down when he was 33 years old. And what, Unlike Marvin Gaye's situation, which was tragic because he was great, you know, he got shot by his father. It was it looked like it was a domestic uh, incident that just happened. The circumstances surrounding Sam Cooke's murder were and belong on you know Hollywood crime. There is, there is a legitimate conspiracy behind it, and I say that only because Sam Cooke, 
on the on December 11th, 1964, was shot at the Hacienda Hotel, which was a well, motel, sorry, which was a place known for if you want to take have extramarital affairs with prostitutes or escorts, that's where you would go, and it was known for that. At the time, it was a three dollar a night room stay. So for someone like Samuel wow. Cook, who's an a, you know going to the best restaurants and. You could live there for a thousand dollars a year, <laughs> pretty much. Wow, P- pretty much. And the manager at the time, Bertha Franklin, was a had a reputation for being in the escort business, like in that in that industry, in the adult industry, which, and so and was later booked on those charges for an entirely separate incident. So on December 11, nineteen sixty four, Samuel Cook, the king of soul music, one of the brightest stars at the time, who paved the way for Marvin Gaye, for James Brown, uh, because he said, hey, listen, for, uh, uh, my God. Uh, yeah, all the artists that Yeah, everyone from, you, you, yeah. that you can think of. Uh, Little Richard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Little Richard. And he opened the doors for all of them. He performed at the Copacabana in New York, the one of the, it's, you know, how, you know basically elite. Mm-hmm. At the time, in 1958, when no, no, no black people were allowed yeah. to attend. But he said, I took the gig to perform there to show that hopefully it would pave the way that if you can what you know, if I can be in there and perform, then it'll hope, you know, open it up. The amazing thing about that time is a black artist could be on the marquee, but have to use the rear entrance, which yes. was so stupid. <laughs> no. And, and it was, and at the time, if you sang a gospel song, they said you were getting maybe about 20 million of an audience. But if you get white people to get it, you go to 80 million. Obviously, yeah. you get that 60 million bump, you end up on the Billboard's top 10, yeah. like Elvis. And he competed with Elvis at the time, and he was at the time beating Elvis. You Send Me was one of the first songs that came out there, and it, you, know, you, you, got, you were getting white teenage girls to fall in love with it because he was a handsome guy. He had that mm-hmm. swagger about him. He had that commanding presence that you're like, I should hate this guy, but I can't. He's just too good. Yeah, and I'm sure Elvis was inspired by him. You know, right. Elvis... Grew up in the deep south and was heavily influenced by gospel, and he worshipped singers like that. Right, and so what happened was, you know, he would still get, you know, he did the gospel tour, and then when he decided to go away from gospel into rock and roll, he recorded under Dale Cook, which was his brother's name, to try and try and give a, because you can't openly record rock and roll when you're a gospel singer. Hmm. It just doesn't work that way, but. You know, he tried it out. He said, I got a taste for it. And he said, he openly admitted to Dick Clark, I, I did it because financially it's better. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. at least you can appreciate Sam Cooke's honesty. And he got into uh, the civil rights movement. He was friends He was friends with Muhammad Ali, with Malcolm X. And he even recorded an album with Muhammad Ali, hmm. which was kind of interesting. They actually kind of performed a little tidbit. And Muhammad Ali, you know, too, was so sh- shaken by Sam Cooke's murder that he said that had this been Frank Sinatra, the pl- LAPD would investigate it. What happened was he gets, when he gets shot, and uh, when he died by a gunshot, was the official sa- statement, the police r- ruled it as justifiable homicide yeah. and didn't, do, didn't conduct an investigation on it. Hmm. And so Muhammad Ali said, hey, this was, you know, Frank Sinatra, there'd been an investigation. On December 11th, 1964, Sam Cooke and a... Uh, Female companion. Female companion <laughs> by the name of, uh, I believe, uh, Eloise Bayer. So earlier that night, Sam Cooke is at a Martoni's, which is a big restaurant with his producer and his producer's wife. They're having drinks. He goes to the bar. He sees Eloise Bayer. They have a conversation. His producer says he's supposed to meet me at another club later on that night. Sam never showed. Word is he showed up 15 minutes before closing time with with the lady, with the young lady, and then left. And around 2.35, they go to the Hacienda Motel. And by about 3 o'clock, Eloise Baylor comes out of the room with her clothes and grabs and had Sam Cook's clothes while he went to the bathroom, saying that he attempted to rape her. Ran down, told Bertha Franklin, who was the night manager at, at the Hacienda Motel, and she ran across and made a phone call in, at a telephone booth across the street to call the police. Sam Cook comes downstairs to the office, and Bertha Franklin, the manager, says, "Oh, he scared me." Pulls out her twenty-two, and shoots him in the chest. Uh, Fired three shots, hit him once in the chest, and then 
His and according to her testimony, she goes, she says, "Lady, you shot me, not out of anger. Like I, I can't believe you fucking shot me." Yeah. And then, after that, he comes towards her. She drops the gun and hits him on the head with the broomstick, and had to get physical with him. And then, and then he finally collapsed from the gunshot, and the police came in and said, initially they didn't know who it was. They said, "Oh, it's another N word," you know, who got shot because you know it's the bad part of town. Didn't realize until later on, like, oh my god, that's Sam Cooke. And then they had to, you know, say, oh, we, we. so where the conspiracy theory part comes in is he was shot with the 22, but Bertha Franklin, uh, and these were articles by People Magazine and a few other places, saying that she had a registered 32. And the bullet was went missing from LAPD evidence locker. Hmm. And they were conducted. And during the funeral, Etta James, the renowned singer, when she looked at his face, at, at his body, said he, he looked like he, he had, you can. You know, obviously, you can't see the bullet wound. Looked like his head was almost detached from his shoulders. His, he had taken so much damage; his hands were, fingers were crushed. Well, that's not a twenty-two. No, and it's not, <laughs> and that's not a broomstick either. Yeah, it's not yeah. a broomstick. And then the thing is, so let me get this straight: Sam Cook bur- bursts in wearing just a sports coat because he all his clothes had been taken. His clothes were he had weighing five thousand dollars because he was he was waving that around at the bar. Yeah, maybe and his blood alcohol level was high. So there's some things that don't work in the favor of Sam Cook. Sure. But his money was gone. Money was never returned. The $5,000 that was in the clip. And uh, apparently, Lois Baird, the lady, grabbed the clothes, including his, and ran out. So he was almost naked. So he just grabbed a sport coat and a, and a shoe, and he ran downstairs. So that's what he was found in. And, and his friends and family speculate that this, this female companion, who I guess had a fairly long rap sheet, yes. was in the process of robbing Sam Cooke. And when he realized what was going on and came out after her, that he was shot for trying to get his possessions back. And in 1979, she's booked exactly for that, for committing robbery because she was a, and being an escort. Oh, yeah. okay. So that was her... Yeah. That, that was her, her thing. That her, was her yeah. gimmick. Her yeah. yeah. And it, it's just... It, it was tragic. Uh, he pro- And, you know, Sam probably at the time didn't do himself any favors, and he did have a history of having extramarital affairs because at the time he was on his second wife who had two kids at the time and he had cheated on his first wife who tragically died in a a car accident in 1959 they were Uh married from 53 to 58 and so you know so it didn't obviously but that that doesn't excuse anything right tragedy yeah right so it's just where the edda james and several are saying you know i looked at the makeup like that was not a broomstick that you hit him on the head Mm -hmm. with there's no little knot there was significant stuff that but nobody came to testify. So yeah, who was who was her John? You know, yeah, that's or, that's, or if, that's what I would guess. Yeah, did someone put there. her up to it? Did yeah. someone you know have her lead him out into some sort of an ambush? Do you, right. do you know any you of the of, theories out there? Well, the motives are that one of his uh, producers at the time, who was known, who had a pretty bloodthirsty reputation, according to people, wanted access to Cook's millions. Mm. Sure. And so this was one way he figured that you know if. If you have crushed hand, uh, bones in both your hands and that kind of facial damage, like you've been beat the hell out of, that looks like someone's trying to get some information out of you. Mm. Maybe that's or coerce you or torture you. Wow. And uh, yeah, there, because he had access, to, he had earned a lot of money, and then he'd recorded, he recorded uh, albums that got released after his death, posthumously, yeah. and won awards. And he ended up making. He's in the Hall of Fame of several different genres. He's known in like the top ten of all music artists at all all time. And yeah. You know, they've done documentaries. I think uh, Leslie Odom Jr. did a movie. It's uh, One Night in Miami, which was a theatrical play, I think. I've heard of that. Uh, Paul Mooney originally played in 1978. Okay. Right? And then right. Leslie Odom Jr. played the a- adaptation. Um, I remember that came out a couple years ago, but I didn't hmm. know the story. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those stories. You know, like I said, I've always been a, a Sam Cooke fan for a long time. And then as, you know, Google gives you access to all this information. I remember sitting around thinking one day, well, whatever happened to Sam Cooke? And then making the mistake of Googling it and going, oh, my God. I had no idea that he had met that tragic, violent end. It was shocking. Joe sounds innocent here, but what he knew was he was pushing me down that exact same <laughs> rabbit hole. Said, because that's the reaction I had. I went, what? And then yeah. I just kept going down saying, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then so, no investigation hmm. was done. I just at the time, you know, 1964, LAPD had an, was, I mean, always had a reputation of being very racist. And the police chief Parker at the time, yeah. 
was not a fa- uh, favor of any ethnic minorities. And so this was just one of those instances that, hey, listen, let's cover it up. Let's just leave it aside. And that's why when you had people like Ma- you know, Muhammad Ali going, I can't believe you're not investigating this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. So it's one of those, you know, life's unanswered questions. We'll probably never know the truth. I would imagine any evidence that's sat in a LAPD uh, evidence locker uh, is gone or we'll never know. Imagine what, what kind of uh, unnamed uh, warehouses the LAPD has right. out is in it, the desert. Is, with, is there like a warehouse kind of 13 stuff? of their own kind of stuff? Now, the, the, the <laughs> thing was, well, what's the motive for killing someone at that age when you know if, if you want to view him as if you're a mu- music producer, he's a cash cow. Yeah, he's going to keep making records if he if his voice carries to this. That's five decades worth of money. Why would you get rid of him? Yeah, yeah. Like, what what's the motive there? So the other idea is that okay, you were getting a little bit too involved with the civil rights movement, and if Muhammad Ali had, was very vocal about eventually when s- s- Vietnam happened, what might have happened then? So you could see Sam Cooke yeah. being a identified as a troublemaker, and the FBI was keeping mm-hmm. tabs on Malcolm X and uh, Muhammad Ali at the time. Yeah, and so anyone who becomes friends and associates go, oh, well, you get on the radar. And at the time, you have, you have Hoover going through, and he said, well, any, any friends of Ma- Malcolm and Ali are friends of mine. You know, speaking of, uh, this is a little off topic, but it, you reminded me of that. I just read today or yesterday that Mickey Dolenz of the Monkees, who I just saw just the other day, <laughs> uh, we hung out. Uh just a day or two after seeing him, news broke that he's suing the FBI, who apparently kept files on the monkeys. So yep. during the you know the '60s and yeah. stuff, man, they I, I remember FBI hearing, was just, hearing that. Yeah, yeah. What? same with the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. anyone yeah. that's identified as a troublemaker that's you know challenging the author- challenging authority, yeah. getting people to think independently. Even it's scary though because the the influence that the FBI has on culture that's what makes me sick. I can yeah. understand like crime. And obviously, you know, corruption within the government. But going after cultural things like that, that's... Well, back then... You that know, needs they, to be called out. <laughs> they considered liberalism akin to communism. Yeah. And to them, nothing was a bigger threat to our way of life here in America than communism. And so I would imagine all these guys were identified as commies to the FBI and J. Edgar yeah. Hoover and and uh, were, were kept tabs and probably had their phone bugged and all that stuff. It's yep. such a shocking period. And you you wonder if the Constitution is listening yes, in right yes. now. Oh no, so, they absolutely are, and yeah, but yeah. we're we're okay with it because look, the, you know the phone. I oh, mean, yeah. when, you, it's you a hear, Faustian bargain, right? Yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know it's like right now when people say the government will get all the information, I'm like they might have, they could have just bought it from Facebook and Google. Yeah, because exactly. they have all my information because I've clicked on just, okay yeah, so many just times. Just be careful what what you put out there on on the yeah. phone. That's all you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, uh, look, if the black helicopters come for me. I'll just be like this. I can't believe they sent a helicopter. <laughs> you really didn't need it. Have you looked? Have you seen me? It won't take much. Yeah. I, I don't think they're interested in my Hot Wheels and action yeah. figures. <laughs> so. No, but you're right. Absolutely right, Joe. Artists, anyone Amazing. that came with music that could get people to think independently, to get pe- people to think of challenging authority or asking questions. Yep. You know, It's not just chaos for chaos sake. You know, everyone had a motivation. If you don't want to go to war, it makes sense. If you don't want to, if you want to fight against racism, it makes sense. If you want to fight against income inequality, it makes sense. Because that's what, you know, it's one thing, oh, you want to fight for civil rights. Yeah, you want to start messing with people's money. Okay. <laughs> now nah, you're going to. Yeah, exactly. Well, we were talking about uh, Motown earlier. Some of the biggest names in Motown was uh, Four Tops, Temptations. Yeah. Uh, so there's our segue to Andrew, who brings our next topic to the table. Yes, uh, Paul Williams, one of the founding members of The Temptations. Uh, so, yeah, he made a, met a tragic death at uh, 34. Um, a couple blocks west of Henry Ford Hospital, right on uh, Grand West Grand Boulevard. Oh, no. So, yep, yep, very sad. But, yeah, he was born down in Alabama and, and had, had a, uh, a classic upbringing of, of that time and place. Uh, was musically gifted as a kid and then came up north and uh, signed with Motown. Temptations were started. Uh, but he, like, you know, we see a common theme here, had, a tr- you know, lots of trouble with uh, substance abuse and couldn't keep keep up with touring and recording probably, what, three or four albums a year like they did back then. Yeah. Um, and so he was always uh, a troublemaker. And, you know, the... 
the fame feeds it, you know, if you let it. <laughs> like Icarus, don't fly too too close to the sun. Right. Yeah. right. Um, so he, at, apparently at the time, he was also um, screwing around with another woman um, who was also involved with, the, I believe, the Supremes. And okay. uh, there's nothing, of, I'm not going to mention her name, there's nothing about her on on Google or anything, uh, but I guess she was, she just kind of got caught up with it. Um, anyway, um, he also met, uh, a, the end, uh, with a bullet. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Um, what are they, what are they, they officially classified as just a... Okay, so here, here's where it gets, where it gets funky. All right, so it was, it was ruled, uh, a suicide, but they, the cops found the pistol in his right hand, but the gunshot was on his left, the left side of his head. So he would have had to go like this. Yeah. Yeah. And shoot himself, <laughs> you know, uh, just try, little... trying to reach his yeah. shoulders. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, he, the, the gun had been discharged twice, uh, but he had only been shot once. So I'm thinking it might, might be a jealous lover, you know, who's mm. the, the third person. And he crossed the, uh, like one too many people, but there's, I search, I searched it today. There's no other evidence after that. Like there's just like a dead end. Any suspects? Su- su- or... Suicide. Suicide. Uh, no, not that I found. Wow. Yep. So, so they find they find him. He was in a car. You said. No, no. I'm before? sorry. He was he was uh, on the sidewalk. Just like. Oh. What? A, yeah, I believe it, I believe it was a alley. Uh. Wow. Oh no no no. You're right. Yeah, it was a it was a car. Okay. But it, a car in an alley. So they find him. He's dead in the car. They find a gun. Yep. They say, "Oh, it's obvious suicide." But things but there's, don't quite. There's, add there's up. no the the hard evidence that 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 was there. Somebody said either this isn't worth looking into, or mm-hmm. shoot, mm-hmm. I know who else might be involved. I'm, we're not going to go any further with this. Yeah, yeah. Either way, it. I believe it stopped right there. Yep. Do you have any theories? Yeah, you got theories. That's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, you got theories. Maybe someone else in the Motown scene was also uh, romantically connected. To- so you're going, you're mm. thinking, you're leaning towards romantic jealousy. Uh, I would say so. Hmm. No, would say not, so. not, not financial conspiracy. I, I wouldn't say so. Okay. Yeah. Was it, was he involved? Was he also identified as a troublemaker? Or was he, you know, the, on the FBI's uh, hit? Poster? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. But he did. Yeah. You said he had a history of addiction yeah, and yeah, stuff his, like his, that. History okay. of addiction and, uh, you know, more more so behind the scenes. You know, uh, I don't think a whole. Did he, owe, did he owe money to people? Maybe if he had a, a an addiction issue. Yeah, that would be another theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's possible. Yeah, because like mm-hmm. you said, you can't, you can't be in a car in an alley, be right handed and have a left sided <laughs> bullet wound. That right. means this guy, and then have two shots. This gun's missing. Uh, two bullets. Yeah, yeah. What, There's only one what, shot. One more. Uh, uh, thing of evidence that I, I could have found was that he had a bottle of some sort of alcohol in his hand. And I think they said it was like a, a liquor bottle and it was, it was crushed. So as if he had fallen, hmm. well, you know, shot himself with one hand <laughs> going like this, reaching over on the other side of his head. And the other hand was holding a liquor bottle. Yeah. That's some sort of uh that's some sort of uh Human contortionist, right there. That <laughs> that is one yes. magic bullet. Yes. Yeah. Th- th- this is a lazy cover up. I, yeah. I I mean, I you you would forgive. have to, you'd have to somehow you know get get the the files with the DPD about what was officially in the record and then go from there. And but, the Detroit but, newspapers didn't find that the least bit curious. Uh, the, the fact that you the, the one one fact that you just mentioned. Right. A yeah, right handed. We're, uh, we're we're the journalists, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you have to envision, you know, they they see the crime scene, they ask a few questions, they go, you know what, we're probably never going to solve this, so let's let's just wrap it up. And it's, it's unsatisfying, especially for him and his family and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's well, no real justice got well, it's done, one thing. Feel. It's one thing when police say, look, ma'am, we'll be honest with you, with, with people that steal your purse, nine times out of ten, we're not going to find it. We're not going to catch the cut person. It's just one of those things. We get, it's so much petty crime that... But, but but this is a murder fat- a fatality. Yeah, we're not even gonna say murder. Even if you just keep it at fatality, you 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 got to dig to the bottom of it. 
Well, I mean, we just talked about Sam Cook and it's justifiable homicide. You know what I mean, <laughs> just yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, Joe. I gotta be honest with you. Every time I, uh, you tell a story of your trips to L.A., it plays out like a Wes Anderson movie, in my, in my head, like a little <laughs> clip, <laughs> like, like who you I run try. into and like the location. You know, yeah, I have like Michael Jackson moonwalking across. I just think like that's a great Wes Anderson clip. That was such a great memory. That was such a great moment. And and like I said, you know, Motown. Growing up here in the Metro Detroit area, Motown was just such a huge factor. That's what yeah. they played on the radio. You know, the oldie stations. And um, and like I said, to going going to the Motown Museum was was like a holy pilgrimage. It was like visiting a church. Yeah, uh, that's that's what it felt like. And you know, I, I imagine. Uh, equivalents out there would be like Sun Studios in Memphis where rock and roll was born. And right. uh, there's, uh, it, I went to Minneapolis and visited First Avenue, which was featured in Purple Rain. Yeah. So there yeah. are venues like that across America that you, you walk in and there's just something about it. And, and that Motown studio and museum is, is right up there, I think, with, with some of those legendary places of music. Um, one more story I wanted to bring up. Uh, this is a, one of the more recent stories along these lines, but uh, definitely intriguing uh, considering um, how there were trials in the 90s that were basically broadcast live on television and captivated America and got everybody talking. And uh, one of those was, was fairly recent. Um, Born in 1939, Phil Spector was a record producer and songwriter uh, who produced with the the Ronettes, the Crystals, Ike and Tina Turner. In the 70s, he produced Let It Be for the Beatles as well as some of their solo stuff. He worked with the Ramones, produced some of their, their big hits, kind of uh, the more, I don't want to say mainstream hits, but the more popular hits from the Ramones. This guy had it all. It's a it, Hall of Fame feels, resume. Yeah, and uh, he, he he created what they call the Wall of Sound, um, which was his signature when he produced music. And and the guy had everything, um, but he had a he he got in a car accident, a really serious car accident in L.A. where he went through the the windshield, and paramedics who arrived on scene thought he was dead, but they felt a, a faint pulse and said, "Oh my God, this guy's still alive," and so he got all sutured back up and and he his life was saved but he had stitches and stuff all over his head his scalp was all cut up and everything and from that moment on he started wearing these really wild wigs now if you have an image of phil specter in your head it's these crazy hair things and those were wigs some of them look like tumbleweeds yeah yeah, like yeah. In, the, in the southwest <laughs> and it was so shocking when a when a mugshot uh was posted where he he was bald i was like Oh my God, he's unrecognizable. I was so used to seeing him with those giant afros. Uh, so here's a guy who had everything, and then he became a little bit of a recluse. And the story goes that on the morning of February 3rd, uh, it, he was at the House of Blues, and this was, uh, let's see, 2003. Uh, he was at the House of Blues, and he met an actress named Lana Clarkston. And I looked up Lana a little bit on, online, and she did a, a couple of B movies. Uh, but apparently she played a teacher in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So now i got to go back and rewatch oh, wow. that movie, which just had an anniversary recently. Uh, but Lana meets Phil Spector at the House of Blues. Uh, they get into his limo, and the driver takes him back to the mansion. Uh, the driver waited outside. Phil went into uh, the mansion with Lana, and the driver, about an hour later, hears a gunshot. Well, at some point... Uh, Phil Spector walks out of the back door, and I guess the driver saw him, and he had a gun in his hand. He said, I think I just killed someone. So the driver calls 911 and repeats what Phil Spector had said. But at some point, Spector described it as an accidental suicide. Accidental suicide. Wow. But you you had the gun in your hand. You said, I think I just killed someone. But now he's calling it an accidental suicide. So it goes to trial. Uh, the driver, Adriano de Souza, uh, was the key witness uh, uh, hearing the gunshot and seeing Spectre with the gun in his hand. Uh, so they began a murder trial, uh, 2007, four years, where Phil was still producing records yeah, he, as he awaited trial, which I 
find amazing. And the trial was televised live. And that was one of those, you know, in the wake of OJ right. and, yeah. and stuff like that. Like it's kind of a circus. That's the yeah. next yeah. that's the next big thing to People latch on to. were riveted. Like this is this felt like scripted television. Uh, and it resulted in a mistrial. I think it was, the jury was 10 to 2 in, in favor of a murder c- conviction. So they called it a hung jury and called it a mistrial. So it, about a year later, boy, our, our justice system, my God. Yeah. Uh, there was a retrial about a year later, which was not televised. Uh, this time the jury returned a guilty verdict of second-degree murder. So not premeditated, but second-degree murder. He was immediately taken into custody and sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. Uh, He appealed several times, but uh, in January 16, 2021, not that long ago, he died of possible COVID complications at the age of 81. So he pretty much died in prison. So, uh, you know, we were talking about these victims of whether, you know, their excesses or being shot by somebody else. This guy brought it on himself. Right. And... Uh, one of the odd things that I read as I researched this is when people were when when people were writing about this, they said, "Oh, Specter's career was upended by this murder." Like they they made it sound like he was his career was put on hold, his career was interrupted by this, it, uh, this untimely right. murder. It was an inconvenience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's so shocking. It's so shocking that. The media portrayed him as some sort of a victim or something. See, it's one thing to write something like that, but what editors allow that to go through into print, <laughs> print at some point? Well, apparently, some of those that did print these articles recanted when there was such a a vocal uh, response, like you know, in, in the wake of you know uh, social media and all that stuff. People were like, "What the hell?" And so, some of these uh, journalists posted retractions, saying, "Okay, well, may, maybe we." phrase that incorrectly but yeah uh, because he was you know the bigger celebrity of the two uh he was the victim and from from what i heard at the time and since then uh he's he used the phrase that she kissed the gun and he tried to paint it as if she brought it on herself she she oh. shouldn't have worn that dress. Right? <laughs> right, exactly. the same mentality. Well, it's almost yeah. like, oh look, Phil, it's a gun. Ha <laughs> ha. And then what? It... Yeah. Now, this is kind of a, a gruesome detail, but he painted a picture as if she had put the gun in her mouth. The crime scene, though, uh, found teeth like scattered everywhere, which meant her mouth was was closed, possibly clenched as he pressed the gun up against her mouth. Uh, and uh, whether it was inadvertent or, or what, but uh, apparently the gun went off as he was showing off his gun, maybe trying to intimidate her. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah. Accidental suicide. I mean, at some points, we just can't just marry two different words in the, in the, in, in the English dictionary. That'd be like saying, hey, Andrew, Joe, I committed an unexpected robbery. I'm like, no, that's yeah. a robbery, Nick. You just... Yeah, and you know, that's the weird thing about our legal system is it all evidence points to this guy putting a gun up against her face and pulling the trigger. But people are allowed, when it goes to trial, to plead not guilty and cause this lengthy right. trial. And it's like, come on. We all know yeah, what like, happened. Yeah, like where was the missing technicality on yeah. the prosecutor's point? Yeah. Or, you know, on their side. Well, I wonder the two jurors in the first trial that resulted in the hung jury, the two that voted to acquit or whatever, what the hell did they see? What what would prompt them to say, "Oh, this is all a silly misunderstanding"? Look, I I love Twelve Angry Men. It's one of my it's one of my favorite movies. But I love that. Movie. This is you know not everyone can be like, isn't it possible? No, no, I think Phil did it. Yeah. So here's a guy, legend in the music industry could have you know ended his life with in the hall of fame as one of the greatest influences on pop and rock and roll music and and uh everything is marred by this weird display of power like the show of force to this beautiful actress uh that resulted in in this tragic consequence it's it's so it's shocking the story is so shocking to me now i'm not trying to cause a controversy myself here but isn't it still a Hall of Fame uh, record? 
Uh, yeah, the work I mean, that's I'm, done. I don't excuse the the crime. But no, you're right. I, I'm sure producer. he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'll have to right. verify that. Maybe one of you guys pull out your phone right. and see if he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But that you know that brings up with the, the time that we have left. That brings up a good uh, time to bring this up. Do you judge a performer, an artist, whether it's a musician or an actor? Do you judge them just on their body of work, or do you allow their personal lives? Their, their controversies that they may have been involved in to affect your perception of the artist. I'll, I'll give you a, a perfect example. Uh, Michael Jackson. Yeah. Um, when allegations were brought against Michael Jackson, and then I started hearing graphic descriptions of what he did at the sleepovers and stuff, I have to admit that I, I can't listen to his music the same way anymore. When I hear his voice, when I hear his music, I think about these crimes that he committed uh, against children, and it has affected my perception of the performer. How do you guys feel? Yeah, it's it's just one of those things you gotta. It kind of jolts you, you know, out of out of uh, you know a waking dreamland. Like, hey, well, s- some people who make some of the coolest uh, art are, you know, they're gonna have issues. <laughs> um, it, yeah, you, you just you gotta consciously like separate um you know the the person the, from the, the, the sin yeah. from the center or whatever way yeah, you yeah. want to look at it i, I, I yeah. i'm i'm a i'm a i'm a big woody allen fan i think mm. his stuff in the 70s was great is he a perv probably <laughs> but but the, the, the some of his movies are, are brilliant in my opinion so you, you just you got to weigh like is it worth my reputation to say that, you know, oh, you know, I support this person no matter what, or I hate that person because they did one, one bad sin. You know, y- 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 y'all got, you got to juggle it. Yeah. I don't, I don't fault anyone. Like for instance, what you just said, it makes perfect sense. Cause it's a, and it's a human thing. It's, it's, it's impossible to separate because whatever, they're all performers. Their art evokes emotions, evokes mm-hmm. feelings, evokes memories. And so you think about, I didn't know it at the time, but you know, okay, my my both my mom and dad are big fans of Bill Cosby when uh, he did, did yeah. the stand up thing. I can watch that stand up now and say, "Wow, that is funny." Yeah. And now I know at the time what he's doing, and it's tragic. It's the same thing with Michael. It'd be like if something someone came out and said, "Did you know that Beethoven sold poison milk to school kids?" <laughs> like what? <laughs> oh my God! But <laughs> Beethoven, you know. Yeah. So I'm uh, look. I'm not trying. To, it doesn't forgive anything. It's like in sports when the steroids issues were happening. O.J. Simpson. Great running back, great football player. I don't think he should lose the the Heisman Trophy because he earned that. <laughs> but he also did something yeah. very, you, very bad. You, 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 you at, we're having this uh, conversation at, as a society. Like we got to in, in these sorts sort of ways where there's not always hard and fast laws about people getting exposed for antisocial behavior. I guess you could say. Um, but we're having this conversation, like you know, should the punishment or the the punishment should fit the crime you know does this person deserve to be thrown under the bus i i feel you know hard i and i i'd like to say no i give people the benefit of the doubt at least you know i i'm okay compartmentalizing it and i'm okay if someone says oh my god so you're okay with like a child murder i said no (laughs) i respect the art and the creativity that went into it i don't condone the menace and evil and criminal that, that came into it, but I can't deny the work that's made. That's reality. Yeah. There, reality, someone got, a crime was committed. Reality, an art was created. What, that same brain did both of those. I can't. Yeah, and, and I, you know, it's hard for me to, to come to a conclusion on any individual if it's a he said, she said situation. Right. You know, there are accusations about comedians and musicians and athletes and stuff, and we weren't there, and we don't know what happened. And, yeah, if there are multiple accusers coming forward, I think that lends some weight to the accusations. But still, unless unless there's evidence or or it goes to trial and they're proven guilty, I I think it's unfortunate that a lot of people are tried in social media. Right. Like, if something goes wrong in social media, you're toast. You're done, man. And I don't think that's very fair. So no, no yeah, it's it's not. But it's, if it's it's, if it's a it's lack a of social said, maturity, I'll, I'll yeah. be you know, and I'm fine with saying that. You can appreciate art. There, there's a lot of there are a lot of artists that are in museums right now that did 
terrible, awful things. Okay, for instance, Mount Rushmore. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I understand every one of them was a slaveholder. They massacred the natives, the indigenous people. Not and, every one of them. Well, okay, true. I, Lincoln. There's different, yeah, Lincoln. But, <laughs> but, but, but no, I understand right, what you're but saying. But every one of them has some form of, yeah. oh my God, I can't believe they did that. You, you know. And on top of that, originally they were going to carve Native Americans in there, and they said, ah, that's not a draw. But, so they changed it. But they, they made right on that, though, with uh, the uh, uh, monument. Uh, uh, was it was Sitting it? Bull, or uh, which one was it? Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse, was I it? think. Yeah, yeah. It's right. right by there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, my, my thing is, so I can, and I can appreciate the, I wouldn't say the Constitution is the greatest piece of uh, democracy ever written. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> when you have to give rights... What made the, for me? What made the Constitution amazing is it can be changed. Yeah. yeah. So the, the amendments. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it has the ability to change based on if whatever we did wrong, we can undo. Yeah. So yeah. I can I make my peace with that. I know exactly what they did. It was horrific, and it's a time. It's basically maturity. Like you said, don't just say, "Well, it's black or white." If you live in a black or white world, good luck, because <laughs> yeah, eventually right. you're going to find yourself on the wrong side. Yeah. Well, a lot of the names that we mentioned today, yeah. when I do hear their music today. I'm filled with sadness about what might have been. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, watching The Doors, Val Kilmer's portrayal of Jim Morrison, he, he was a genius. And I don't know if it was his vices that brought it out, but I, I know there was a scene in the movie where they were trying to record in the studio and he was so drunk, it was just terrible, and they just stopped recording and said, we can't do anything. But then when he had a moment of clarity, he was able to go into the, the uh, studio and just create brilliance and and so a lot of these names, like I said, that died young, I hear their songs and I enjoy their music, but then there's the sadness of what might have been had they not done this to themselves. So, so the danger of creativity. Yeah. The curse of creativity. And you wonder, like, why does it seem like that goes hand in hand so often, that drug use and abuse and alcohol abuse create these amazing artists? Do, do, do these vices create the artist? Or I, I don't know why that seems to be it such a, a common thing. Yeah. You never, you yeah, know, yeah. yeah, it's a chicken and the egg. Which yeah. one starts what? Because were they created when they were younger? Because you always hear, oh, so-and-so was always doing stuff, was so musically inclined, so gifted with writing or acting. No, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's if creativity is all in here and everything that you mentioned, alcohol and drugs, affects this. Yeah, because, I mean, the Beatles, you know, of course, they experimented with LSD and all this other stuff, and they introduced others uh, to these types of things, and... I don't know. Some say that, oh, they created some of their greatest work under the influence of drugs. And I'm like, okay, I guess. I don't understand it. Joe, I'd also like to point out, and Andrew, thank you for doing this, uh, uh, not not stopping me, uh, a rookie move. I said this. I'm gesturing on a podcast in my head. <laughs> you know, thankfully, there's a video we do component. Have a camera here, right. So. But if someone's just listening to the audio thing, I was gesturing to my head saying, the, pointing to creativity, and that's where alcohol and drugs affect. So, <laughs> rookie move on my part. Go to, Sorry. Go to YouTube to see the hand gestures <laughs> yeah. if you're curious. Um, all right, with that, I think we're going to wrap up this uh, episode of Hollywood Crime Scene, uh, the day the music died for a lot of people. And we will be back very, very soon with uh, more episodes of uh, tragedy and Hollywood from the film industry. And uh, we're going to have an episode coming up uh, in a month or so as the elections roll around to talk about uh, political scandal and murder and intrigue, uh, which I'm... Uh, I hate to use the word excited, but I'm. It, there's a lot. There's a lot to. There's a lot to unca- uncover there. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, guys, great job as usual, and we will see you again on a future episode of Hollywood Crime Scene. Peace Take out. Care.